tonight, we try to have a special guest speaker, and I asked Jim to come out, hence why a bunch of you guys are here. Um, I, how, how old are you now? 36, I think. Did I meet you when you were 19? Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I was just thinking through, I think I met Jim when he was 19. And uh, for 10 years, I worked at a, uh, a long-term uh, discipleship program in Chester called City Team. And uh, I, Jim came through our program five times, by the way. Like five times where we got to the end where he almost completed it and knew him for a long time. Ever since I met him from day one, we had a really strong click. And I'm going to say something. He's extremely talented in many areas. Not only does he look good and he can talk good, but he can fix anything and work any angle whatsoever. Uh, but we really grew strong. Uh, I knew something was different after his last time, which he's going to talk about. Uh, and uh, we moved into this community first. Actually, the guy we bought the house from next door owned your first house. Uh, and we bought first, and then they bought and moved in. And we kind of started both of our ministries and, and uh, right around the time from each other. And uh, our friendship just kind of grew from there. So if there's anybody I'd like to have a guest to come out and speak, it's going to be Jim. So guys, can we give him a round of applause? What's up, everybody? I'm Jim. I'm a, I'm a grateful, recovering alcoholic and addict and a child of God. So I always get so nervous before I speak. Come it's on, just, bro. it's in me. You know what I mean? I'm still, I'm, I'm fear driven. I, last night I'm in my head, oh my God, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? That's who I am. I accept that today. But what I learned through recovery is, is that I have to be willing to drive through this fear, right? I literally already feel better. I got honest. I'm nervous. So what? I get through the fear. It's going to make me feel great. Hopefully somebody learns something. So, um, Thanks, John, for the introduction. Um, looking around, I've known some people in this room for pushing 20 years um, through my addiction, struggling. Um, John brought up City Team. Um, you know, I've been in multiple facilities pushing 40 rehabs. So, you know, my story is my story, and, uh, you know, I hope it touches somebody. So, basically, I grew up with... Um, you know, a sister, I had two parents. I guess I could say it was a normal home. Um, I was an athlete. Um, you know, my dad worked full time. Um, somewhat of a normal childhood to me. You know, some people had more than me, some people had less than me. Um, from a young age, I was always trying to fill a void. I don't know what it was, but there was a void that I was trying to fill with behaviors. And the first behavior, I picked up was stealing. Um, I remember when I was a little kid, I went to my aunt's house and I stole something from them because I wanted it. I knew it was wrong, but I took it anyway. Right? So, uh, you know, moving on years down the road, you know, I continue with sports, continue with other activities. Um, I, I feel like I lived a double life at home. I was good. When I was out in the streets, I was a different type of person. Um, I guess you can call it a chameleon. That's what I was. I blended in. Um, so, uh, you know, I got introduced to alcohol, um, through one of my older cousins and the first time I got drunk, it was a blackout drunk. I blacked out, um, you know, I didn't remember anything and I didn't drink again for a long, long time. Um, hanging out with the wrong people. I indulged in marijuana for the first time and, uh, I really liked it. I liked the way it made me feel and, um, you know, kind of, you know, kept smoking pot and, you know, doing those types of things. And then, you know, my, my journey progressed to cocaine and Wildwood, and then it progressed to um, heroin in Wilmington, Delaware. And then, you know, before you know it, I found myself in an open drug market called Kensington, Philadelphia. And that's where I stayed for a long time. So, um, you know, I went to Kensington, went to rehab. I went to Kensington, I went to jail. I went to Kensington, I went to rehab. And I was in and out, 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 in and out. So many times, so many times. 
so many tears I caused, that's what I paid. I paid my mom's tears, my dad's tears, anybody who loves me, tears. That's what I gave everybody around me was tears. Um, you know, I, I had a child as a child. Um, you know, I was really young. And, um, you know, I get real emotional when I talk about this. Uh, um, my oldest son's 16 now. And, uh, you know, I, I don't talk about this in a meeting much, but I'm going to talk about it today. Uh, my, John's my mentor. Um, you know, we, we've spoken about this before. I feel like I'm at the point where I can publicly say this because I want to be free. I am free. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I was a kid who got another kid pregnant, basically. We were young teens. And, uh, you know, I didn't want a kid. I was scared. I was feared up. So we were doing as much drugs as we could to make that kid not happen. That's what happened. And uh, it did happen. It happened. So um, my son, Christian, he was born at one pound, six ounces, three months early. And, um, you know, I remember being in the NICU unit in CHOP, and there was three other little kids sleeping next to him in the little incubators. They all died besides him, all of them. Two of them were twins, and another one was a little girl. And... Uh, you know, um, I wasn't a father. I wasn't a brother or a son or a good person at all. I was a drug addict and alcoholic that was totally lost in this world with nothing. Nothing. No morals, no values, no self-respect, no care, no nothing. I didn't care. So, um, you know, basically, I got pushed away from my family. I wasn't invited to anything. This continued in and out of rehab and jails and stuff like that. City teams, um, you know, multiple, uh, you know, occasions at city team, pushing a year each time. Um, my relationships grew further and further apart from my family and my friends. Um, and it came down to me and the drug, homeless in Kensington. And that's, that's basically what I did. And, uh, you know, I did some things and stuff, you understand? I did things and I did stuff. I needed drugs. You know what I mean? I hurt people. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's the reality of the addiction. You know, stuff happened to me. You know, I ended up in hospitals. I crashed cars. I hurt, harm people. And uh, that's where I was at spiritually. So, um, you know, I managed to uh, go to jail and get my first year sober. And I, I don't remember what year it was, but it was a while ago. I got a year sober, I got out. The day I got out, I picked up a cigarette and I went to Kensington and I got high. And I, shortly after that, I ended up back in jail again. Um, I did another year in jail, got out. Uh, I think I ended up at Elwyn in media. I didn't have anywhere to go. They put me in Elwyn. So after Elwyn, I went to city team for the first time. And um, it was a humbling experience. Uh, city team's a homeless shelter. Uh, a really nice place though you know it's not the type of place you have to worry about sleeping in your shoes or keeping your money on you or you know there was loving caring people there and spiritually I grew so much they planted a lot of seeds in me and um, you know walking through that door I met a lot of extremely valuable people in my life today that planted seeds in me that looking back now I can say wow that's part of my sobriety and I have to say Marlon Hunter, this man right here, was one of the biggest blessings in my life. Mm -hmm. Taking me through that big book and, you know, hitting me with the cliches and sitting down and talking to me and giving me his time was so valuable. And I see that now. I never saw that before. I didn't value anything. How can it? an older man like him talking to somebody like me who had no self-love and self-care, how can I value somebody sitting down and letting me hear what they have to say so um you know somebody like marlon and he always used to tell me only a fool plays a game with no rules <laughs> who's heard that before and hear from marlon anybody only a fool plays a game with no rules think about it think about that and it's the absolute truth only a fool plays a game with no rules and there's a bunch more but i'll save those for later <laughs> and uh if you sit down with him maybe you'll get some of that um you know and uh 
before the meeting, we were talking outside. Anytime I see him, I make sure I stop and say hello. I don't care what's going on in my life. So he said something very special to me out there. He said, out of all the 20 years I volunteered at City Team, they said I didn't get paid. And he looked me in my eyes and he said, well, look at you. Now that's a payment. For somebody like him to work with somebody like me, right? And see me all these years later and said, look at that value. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's huge. And the best thing as addicts, as people that we can do is learn how to value ourselves. It's the best gift you can give yourself is value. So, um, an investment, which is value. So, um, you know, through the first time at City Team, I met John Clifford, um, amazing human being also. I've learned so much from John. Um, sitting down talking in the office, he taught me more about cooking than anybody has in my whole entire lifetime. Um, he taught me how to wake up early and get prepared in a kitchen setting to feed hundreds of people a day. Um, that was more valuable to me than most things that I learned being in that program. Um, you know, and like he talked about, we, we blossomed into a friendship of, um, you know, loyalty, trust, compassion, love, um, you know, and uh, that's, uh, John's a huge part of my recovery journey too. And, um, you know, I, I consider John a true friend of mine now, a spiritual coach. Um, and I'm just so grateful that I have somebody like John that I can confide in and talk to and uh, get the spiritual guidance I need and life stuff, life guidance too. Um, you know, I consider him one of my best friends and it's a special relationship we have. Um, you know, and I'll talk more about him later uh, in the story. So like we talk about jail, institutions and death, I hit it all. What's left? What's left for me to accomplish in this drug life, in that game with no rules? So, um, you know, I got a couple years out of jail. I got sober, um, ended up in city team. They planted some, some nice seeds in me where I learned some special things. Um, got a year out of there, relapsed, went back in for another year, relapsed. I got another year sober, relapsed. I got 18 months again, relapsed. I got close to two years again, relapsed. I was getting all this time but I was inconsistent in so many areas in my life that I didn't know how to handle it. I was great in a program. You could put me in jail, I was good. You could put me in city team, I was good. You could put me in Paramount, a greenhouse project. I'd be a great, I would be an A student. I'd pass with flying covers. When I'm left to my own devices, right, and I didn't put in the work that needs to be put in, and you put me in my own place or in her house or his couch or her couch or their couch, I'm doomed for failure. And that's something that we like to push is if you're here, just like I was so many times, put the work in. If you put in the work, you'll get the results. If you don't put in the work, you'll get the results. So I started taking suggestions and I started putting in the work. And all of them years sober I had, I picked on little things that I should keep doing and I picked up on things that I shouldn't keep doing. And I'm telling you right now, when I started doing things I shouldn't be doing, God was tapping me on the shoulder. No matter what, I felt him. So I got to a spiritual place in my life, even through addiction, through relapses, where I knew when God was tapping me on my shoulder and he was saying, Jimbo, you got to slow down or you got to pick it up. And if I didn't, he'd start taking things away from me that I thought I needed, right? Like my mom like my dad, like the people that I surrounded myself with, my cars, my clothes, my shoes, the stuff that I valued and I put in front of my recovery and my higher power. So he was great when not, he knocked down all my false idols. He was real good at just flicking them away from me until I was homeless on the street in Kensington with nobody but myself and him, right? And that's where, that's the place I got to all the time. So... Um, let's think, I don't know, 12 years ago, I got baptized at CC Delco, Pastor Bob, amazing human being, uh, such a big guy. All I remember, I was in front of thousands of people. And when I went down, I felt like Jesus Christ himself picked me up <laughs> and I felt awesome. And that was Pastor Bob. And I gave my testimony in front of everybody. And that's when I really started my spiritual journey. 
and I just absorbed from people around me the spiritual guidance that I needed in my life with this addiction that I had. Dude, we're addicts and alcoholics and we struggle with other things. We're not perfect, but we need spiritual guidance and that's what I started getting. And um, um, I um, got out of my last treatment facility after God stripped me of everything again that I was put more important than my recovery. And um, I was willing at this point to throw in the tail and take the suggestions and not make any choices on my own for two years. And that's what I did. So I ended up going to Miramont and uh, you know, I wasn't in it for the wrong reason. I needed it for me this time. That's where I got myself. So I went to Miramont, um, I completed their program. In my mind, I wanted to go back to a familiar recovery house I was already at. And it worked, it did its job. I stayed sober there, I picked up some things, I met a girl, we moved in to together, I stayed sober for a year with her, and then I ended up robbing her for all of her gold, I stole from her parents, I destroyed our relationship, I ruined a lot of stuff, and I ended up back on the street. Driving around on a mountain bike in South Philadelphia where I lived, trying to pawn it for $60 to get another one. With three cars that I had no gas, to put in them. That's where I was at. So I went to Miramont, got help. Uh, in my mind, I wanted to go back to a recovery house in Brumall. Um, and I felt God tapping me on my shoulder through a lot of people. And um, I, I realized I got to shut this down and take the suggestion to go to a place called Lyman House in Delaware. So I <clears throat> totally admitted defeat. I went to Lyman House. Um, they accepted me in, um, it was hard. Lyman house was a hard program, man. Um, they made me complete my step work thoroughly. And I did that. I gave it 110%. I did my step work, not one, two, three, three, two, one. God, I got this. I'll see you later. No, I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And I still do them today. And, um, you know, they got me to the point where, um, you know, they'll, they'll build you up a little bit. And they'll tell you no a lot of times. It's the best thing we can tell somebody like me is no, especially in early recovery. And that's what they did. And I got frustrated. I got mad. I got, I was angry. I was happy. I was confused. My life was getting good, but I wasn't there yet. And I wasn't this dressed up trash can anymore. Just trying to fill these voids. I was really trying to absorb and learn. And I did. And I ended up finding a place to live. And they were like, nah, you're not ready yet after two years. And then I found another place to live and they were like, nah, you're not ready yet. And you know, they shut that down on me and I was willing to stay, just stay is what they always said. So I did that. I just stayed. And, uh, you know, finally about four months later, I was about, uh, maybe 26 months in ish, something like that. God showed me the place I was supposed to go. And that was managing a recovery house that just opened up in Pottstown. It was called right direction living for a buddy of mine. And uh, they're awesome people up there. Um, so the way God worked for me is I was operating heavy equipment up there um, in Pottstown. It's a place called Schwanksville. And uh, the recovery house was literally 15 minutes away. So I got to live for free, run a recovery program, something that I always wanted to do. I just knew I wasn't, I could, how can somebody, you know, dead battery doesn't start a car. So if I'm using drugs, how can I help somebody else that's trying not to use drugs? I can't. So, um, you know, I felt like it was a phase into the right direction. I went there, um, they opened one house I was managing. They opened another house. I was overseeing that one too. My job transferred me back down here. And I said, this is it. It's the time I got to make the move. So I did John purchased 42 house months after he purchased 42 house. I purchased 38 house, which became the first paramount recovery house. Um, I actually lived there by myself doing the work, you know, I mustered up the energy to do it every day and it was a rocky start. It was hard. You know, the, the vision was there, but you know, sometimes I get unmotivated too, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, sometimes I slack and, and discipline it's huge in my life today. So, you know, I got through it. I got it to the point where I was ready to start going into facilities that I've walked through as a client and say, look, here I am. This is what I'm doing. I want to give a presentation and that's what we did. And before you know it, we had a full house. And, um, you know, shortly after that, we got another one. 
John got another one. And me and him, we'd be talking back and forth about how awesome it is to be in service helping men and women get, get sober. Like, what's better than that in our lives? You know, so, um, so that's what we did. And, uh, you know, um, I had my ups and downs running a recovery house and dealing with people and sick people at that, just like me. It's, it's trying. It's hard, especially when you have a big heart and you really understand people and you're compassionate and empathetic and you want people to understand. But we know as much as we tell somebody, it doesn't work. Some people have to figure it out on their own. So, um, you know, it gets rocky being in a position that I'm in. It gets rocky being in any position that we're in when life shows up. Feelings are all the same, no matter what position you're in in life. So, um, you know, then we ended up buying another house and, uh, you know, we're buying more houses right now. And, um, you know, uh, it's been an amazing journey in sobriety knowing that when I gave up is when I gained when I gave up and took a step backwards is when I gained it all you know what I mean and um something John always says to me is remain be, be teachable you know what I mean we always have to be teachable there's always going to be situations and stuff that comes up in life that we have to remain teachable and if you guys are anything like me I can guarantee you if you're in a program, it hasn't been great. I'm sure there's been good times now, but if we get real with ourselves as men, there's a lot of work that we all have to do. And when we get upset and angry with somebody and it's not going our way and there's clothes in the dryer and he ate my food and there's dishes in the sink and Kevin's up my ass, dude, we got to remember why we're here. It wasn't from the past year. This is years of bad decisions that get us in places like this which is which are blessings you know and I mean so um, I never understood that until I had years of sobriety and I actually worked a program when I can look back and be like that guy that I despised and hated that leader that that asshole that guy saved my life in so many ways and it always works out that way when we look back in hindsight, you'll be surprised. The guys that are up your ass and getting on your nerves, and they're the ones we learn the most from. So, um, you know, oh, so I'm getting married. Um, I have, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, so me, a person like me getting married with a wonderful woman. A woman that has value in herself. And I have value in me. And when we come together, that, that triangle goes right to the Lord. And it does. That's what, it, that's what we do. You know what I mean? And um, I have two children, two new children in my life today that can't wait till I walk through that door. They come running up to me. Um, you know, they look for me for guidance. You know, I'm a, I'm a good father today. I'm a good son. I take care of my parents. I show up, I'm available. Um, I love helping people. The guy that was sleeping under the bridge in Kensington on one of his shoes because I didn't have a pillow that would basically do anything for another one, anything. I needed it. You know what I mean? This is who I am today. This is the real gym and more will be revealed. But don't believe the lie. If you struggled and you lost relationships and you know kids aren't in your lives and there's no hope at the end of that tunnel. There is, man. There is, but you have to dedicate all you have to sobriety in the Lord, and I guarantee you it'll work out. I'm Jim. I'm an addict. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.